coming up on episode 55 of the Upful Life podcast. I my main goal and my main prayer is that the listener is able to try to find a way to try to learn more, feel more, see more, and try to know more what's happening in this world. So yeah, and I mean, not just the world of music, but the world of what it is that we're trying to convey to people. So when you ask questions like this, B, about the history of the folklore, the history of this, and these interviews that that I'm doing with you, it changes the narrative of what people will see about who I am as a person, a musician, and as a a leader, and as well as the band members. That's why I say their names with pride. In the hands of time, everybody grew up and are studiers and students of what it is that represents that. So that band were the, the band, the band that has a time, Raja Kasi, Sam Dickey, Munir Zaki, Luke Coranta, Shake and, and Doing, um, Shea Pierre, Courtney Smith. Those musicians are people who are not just conduits of spirit because they play the music. Their genres, their lines of where they studied and they lived and they endured and consume what this is about has graduated them to the next level of spiritual awareness, awakening that the average musician would never know about. Yes, indeedy. Welcome to the Upful Life Podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and this is episode number 55, coming at you live and direct from the Vibe Junkie Studios in Oakland, California. Sammy Hagar said, I can't drive 55. But your boy B. Getz is here to tell you, I'm sure as hell gonna try. Yes, indeedy. Episode 55 of the Up Full Life podcast is brought to you in part by Love That Baby. You can find Love That Baby online, lovethatbaby.net, on Instagram, lovethatbaby13, all one word. Love That Baby is a super cool clothing, apparel, lifestyle company that I've gotten hip to over the past couple years. My man Aaron out there in North Carolina, North Cackalack. Um, You know, Jesus Coombs from Lettuce was maybe the first cat in my circle that I noticed rocking the gear. And yeah, my man Aaron reached out to me a couple years ago. He's like, I want to send you so I want to style you out. And, uh, you know, I've been rocking the Love That Baby hat for a minute now. And uh, 
when I wear it at Swanee or really anywhere in the southeast. Inevitably, somebody gives me the shoo, which I guess is like the universal love that baby shout out. Um, nonetheless, I really appreciate Aaron's vibe. He told me what love that baby's about. It's a catchphrase that his late father liked to use when he was fond of something. Love that baby. And, uh, you know, lost my own father and often hold on to his beloved turns of phrase. So naturally it resonated with me. And uh, yeah, love that baby 13 on Instagram. They have such dope gear too. Uh, if you go to love that baby.net, I mean, it says the crib. <laughs> uh, we're all somebody's baby. And then it's got the classic, you know, kid folded arms, uh, neon logo, sick zip hoodies, got a rugby shirt, t-shirts, stuff for the ladies, for the babies. Y'all know what it is. Check out the good gator. Uh, and he's just got a lot of cool shit going on. And there's a slight Grateful Dead tinge, but it's not overt. It's it's subtle, and I'm all about that. Speaking of the Grateful Dead, you're hearing Isaiah Sharkey doing his cover version of If I Had the World to Give, which is kind of an obscure Dead song. It's on one of the Arista records, either Shakedown Street or Terrapin Station, but it's from that era. They rarely played it live. It's, it's a deep ballad. Um, I had a t-shirt of this song when I was in high school, which is the Garcia, like kind of holding the world. Um, famous shirt. It's made the round. So uh, Isaiah Sharkey, in addition to being a sick jazz player, we just saw him the other night rocking with Maurice Mo Betta, Maurice Brown at the Black Cat in San Francisco. He's Isaiah Sharkey's also D'Angelo's guitar player in uh, D'Angelo and the Vanguard. And most recently, Sharkey was John Mayer's right-hand man in his Sob Rock tour. And he's been playing with Mayer and Pino uh, in that collaborative setting for a good while. So shout out Isaiah Sharkey coming off Mayer tour, no doubt drowning in dead from, you know, one city to the next and then getting off tour and cranking out this epic if i had the world to give let's just check in with the guitar solo for a sec It can't help but sound like it comes out of the soul quarian ether. Um, Isaiah Sharkey, uh, Adam Shmeen Smirnoff, who might be my favorite guitar player in the game, uh, says that Isaiah Sharkey might be the greatest living guitarist. That should tell you right now. Sharkey's opening up at Fool's Paradise, the return of the Lettuce Festival in St. Augustine in June. Same weekend that Lettuce's new album, Unify, hits. So much going down. We got Sacred Rose Festival announcement in Chicago. Shout out my man Berg. Newport Jazz Festival hitting a grand slam this morning. Yeah, I could go on and on. But uh, instead, I want to tell you to please subscribe and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts goes a long way with the algorithms and new listeners spreading the up for life gospel so please rate and review and subscribe to this podcast on your platform of choice hit me up b.gets at upfullife.com send me an email let me know what time it is i appreciate y'all tuning in you can donate to the up for life on upfullife.com check out all my work there i'm trying to do this really fast so we can get to the interview before the end of this song once again, lovethatbaby.net, Instagram, lovethatbaby13, check out the gear, we're all somebody's baby, and if I had the world to give, I'd give it to you.
Yes, indeedy. For episode 55, it is an honor and a privilege to welcome back to the pod, Mr. Weedy Brema. And I gotta say, uh, the first time I talked to him for the pod, uh, it was by phone after Jazz Fest, primarily for a print article. And uh, I was new at the pod thing. Again, it was a phone interview. Still, it was very well received, but I often thought to myself, self, I really got to talk to Weedy again. And then, you know, a couple years later, like several years later, I heard from his his guy over at rope dope and Stretch Music fella by the name of Fabian, who was interested in some coverage on Weedy's Hands of Time band and album by the same name, which is up for a Grammy. They're about to appear at the Blue Note in New York City. They've traveled all over the world with this project, and you're going to hear why in this interview. But uh, I'm close to Luke Caranta from Two Bob Crew. He's a good friend of mine, also a veteran of this podcast. He's in the hands of time. Uh, and therefore, I've always had kind of my thumb on the pulse of what's going on with this crew, and specifically with Weedy, his vision, and uh, the Hands of Time is really like no other band out there. And again, you're going to hear why. Now, I'm sure many of you did not hear episode one um, with, or I shouldn't say episode one, the first time he came on the show. Episode four. Wow. Episode four, Weedy Brema. So you can get hip to that. It's a shorter one. This one runs pretty long, uh, I gotta say. So uh, buckle up. But uh, let's hear from the uh, bio that's on Bandcamp. Weedy Brema is a djembe fola, a master of the djembe, a West African drum with a hollow wood body and an animal skin stretched and fastened over the top the origins of which date back to the 12th century. Brema, who was born in Ghana and raised in East St. Louis, is the product of a family whose musical history goes back centuries. His father, Oscar Sole Brema, was a master drummer and composer whose Uhuru dance band made remarkable records that bridged the gap between jazz and traditional African music. Brema's mother, Ann Morris, was a gifted jazz drummer, and his great-uncle, Idris Muhammad, played with everyone from Grant Green and Horace Silver to Pharaoh Sanders and Ms. Roberta Flack, while also leading his own ensembles. Man, Idris comes up on this pod quite a bit, doesn't he? Now, Brema's latest album, The Hands of Time, puts the interconnectedness of the African diasporic music into practice, featuring a variety of collaborators from around the world, and he definitely fuses jazz with hip-hop and funk, while the sound of the djembe and the spirit of West Africa gives these modern styles a timeless pulse. So yes, I spoke with Weedy. We did the Zoom thing. You're going to hear uh, he, he is a bedazzled king. So he's got the dreads with some beads in it. He's got some bracelets and necklaces. And there's a little bit of jingling and jangling going on. Please believe I was not about to say word one to Weedy about his royal uh, echoes, if you will. So you might hear a shimmy or a shake here or there. Please, you know, disregard. It's all for the love. Weedy gave me everything. I couldn't believe he talked almost two hours and he did most of the talking. Usually I'm like yammering away, but he was just laying it down. School was in session. He takes us to Africa, to East St. Africa, a.k.a. East St. Louis, to New Orleans. Introduces us to his heroes, to his band, uh, to his vision. And, you know, with some rabbit holes and sidebars here and there. And I did my best to... Uh, include some musical drops and samples appropriate to the discussion um and it's a long one uh, and you're hearing an ode to bantuku back to forward from his album weedy brain of the hands of time and we are going to hear from the man himself mr weedy brain on episode 55 of the Upful life podcast yes indeedy
All right. Yes, indeed. It is a glorious day here. Uh, I'm in Oakland, California, and my guest is in New Orleans. Uh, he's been on the show once before, but it's almost, I guess, close to four years now. One of my mm -hmm. first guests ever um, and somebody near and dear to my heart, musically, personally, spiritually. Welcome the one and only Weedy Brema to the Up For Life podcast. Yes. Yes. B, it's good to see you and talk to you, brother, and uh, hear you. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, my friend. And uh, like I said, I'm talking to you in New Orleans. Uh, we we're just mentioning about Jazz Fest, and uh, I just want to start off with uh, the last time uh, we talked. It was about I don't know a month after Jazz Fest 2018, and yes. I had seen the the Essence of Time performance at the Music uh -huh. Box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Hands of Time had a. It was a. It was a very special. It was. I would say it was our true New Orleans debut. I would think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the most, and I don't say this lightly, powerful musical experiences of my life. I was looking back at the pictures that we took in the aftermath. Me and Luke, and me and and the Deitch family, and man, my eyes are so red, and it wasn't from weed. <laughs> okay i just yeah, was man. so emotionally overcome um and that really set me on my own journey uh with music and it, with you in the driver's seat uh african music folkloric culture and that's what i really want to talk about today uh thanks to mm -hmm. fabian he hooked us up for this conversation um and i give yeah, thanks man. man so i wanted to you know when i texted you the other day about you know i'd written up a little something about the the record you mentioned you were just traveling back yeah right? man i just got back from africa yeah i just got back from africa you know uh me and um uh, my wonderful lady miss uh talise campbell we do uh trips to west africa you know we try to do two a year but this time due to covid we couldn't do the two so we did the one so but next year it, god willing inshallah i got some very really cool like i'm really 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 looking forward to it and it's gonna be for you know drummers from all parts of um you know of the corner is gonna deal with you know just musicians trying to get a, a drummers per, per, you know particularly drummers to trying to get a to delve deeper into the genres of music because hell you know not to be a butt but everything comes from africa so shit you might as well delve into the rhythms and the folklore and the things that comes with it so it's something that's gonna be dedicated to drummers and to people and people who are preservers of music and lovers of music, it's, it's something really cool down the pike line. But yeah, I just got back from uh, Africa. I didn't get to go see my family in, in, in Ghana, but I was in Dakar and I was in the Gambia, you know, and it was still great. I was hanging with some amazing, amazing musicians, amazing musicians, um, maestros. So yeah, it was great. Right on. I, I love to hear just a, a little bit about that experience. Like, uh, whether it's this experience or in general, when you travel back home and visit, like what is your life like uh, when you're in Africa? Who are you making music with? Where, where yeah. are the places you're trying to to go, reach, see? Right in in Africa. It, it, well, there's three spaces of that. There's when you go back to visit your family, when you take people, and when you're there just to create a new sound or create. And or it's actually four, and when you go to see your masters. So that's all four different things. Cause basically when you go back, you're not just going back just to, you know, see and you know party and do X, Y. You you basically reing up your energy, your emotion, your spiritual context, your 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 whole being. It's like a form of it's your it's your it's like the original booster shot. <laughs> <laughs> I love you it. You know, since we you know, we, we you gotta use certain words that people can understand, you know, so yeah. But when you go back, for people who have never, who have never been or when people go, there is a joy, there's a happiness, there's a, there's a, 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 a feeling of, of being committed to coming back, if, if I can say it. It's, a, it's just like, it's your it's your pilgrimage that for for people who were born there or, or people who who know the the land it's like it's something you can't never take away from you. It's almost like and I say it I don't say it lightly. It's like coming to New Orleans if you didn't been there once it's like 
I got to go back. It's in the water. It's in the food. It's in the the, the people. It's in the smiles. And it's in the the humbleness. It's in the this the the givingness, the willingness. So when I go back, I go back one to see family, check on family. You know what I'm saying? You know. And that is in itself is a is a trip because to go back to Ghana when you don't go back home every other year or you go back every day, the people are looking for you and they're proud of you. And it's like they hold you in high regard because of the work you've done through the music and through what they see on social media. So it's not like something very small. It's something big to them. You know what I'm saying? And, and these are family members, let alone family members who are musicians. You know what I'm saying? So um, one is to re-up and to learn from my brothers, learn from my masters, whether if I'm going to Mali, I'm going to countries like Guinea, Senegal, but particularly my, particularly Mali with Jimbe music. And there's the old legends and the old people that you know I, I, I want to see and study and, and this hear st- 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 uh, stories and just to hear more about the instrument because the instrument is, is wide, is wide. So, to go back to get that done, to see family, to, to study more, to take people over to see what I am and who I am, both in a traditional context and a contemporary context, as well as to spiritually gain back the strength I need to come back to America or go back to the world to continually to do the job that I'm here to put on this earth to do. And that's not something that you go over there and just to, you know, just the smiles, the happiness, the, the prayers that people give you, the gifts that people give you from the prayers that they give you are all important about coming back to re-up. So I'm able to make more songs. Sometimes that happens while I'm there. Sometimes the griots sing for my, see my praises because, you know, I've done a good deed or because of what my hands have done, they, you know, they, they you know, they say or do certain things. Same with family members. They'll do certain things, you know, and they, they wish me well, they pray for me well. So for me, it's also, it's a trip because when I'm back, everybody's hounding me. Like, so everybody's hounding me. So it's like, right. a lot of people, you know, in America, people see you at a show, it's like, oh my God, you know, we love you, blah, 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 blah. Africa's on 10. <laughs> One, they know you coming back. Two, they know they say, oh, this cat coming back and he been doing good. So it's about, he about to take care of us though. You know, it's all those type of things. And, and the people, and they want you to play. It doesn't matter at what event. As soon as they play, ah. And then because I was raised in America, and you know, you know, to have that same, they, they so they was they, they want to learn all the facets of what it is to be a true African American coming back home. You know, being born there and then coming back home. So they, the style of how I'm looking, the way that I, I present myself, and even the plan. So every time I'm back home, it's like. Oh, what's the Jimmy? Bring, bring, bring him Jimmy. Good Jimmy. And so it's like, even when I don't want to play, it's like, okay, you have to play. But it's not this thing to show off. It's also this thing to show that they love what you've done. So that's my experience. It's to be happy, to eat good, to, to uh, consume emotionally, spiritually, mentally, everything I need. So I'm able to create. Sometimes it's creating back home to bring over like I did on the, ha- the album. And all of those things are important when you go to Africa. That's that's the real thing. It's to emotionally get what you can so you can so you can get on your path to walk where you need to go. So that's Africa. So with the people who want to go with me, that's that's a little little thing, a little, little pun in there. But you will go, that's what you get. And that's what you'll see. You know, you'll see happiness, you'll see love, you'll see music, you'll see peace. And and, and that's what you need. And that's what that's what Africa is. That's what I get, you know, along with the other hustle and bustle and stuff like that. But that's what it is. Oh, man, I love that. Thank you. That was like a, just a beautiful reflection to kind of walk through that experience with you in receipt of all that energy, all that love, yeah. all that attention. Um, amazing. Thank you. And, and you talk about back home and uh, when you're referencing Africa. But I know also home is is East East, St. Louis. East St. Louis. So I want you to tell the people who don't know, and myself included, what is East St. Africa to you? (laughs) Yeah, that's the, there we go, baby. Now you're getting (laughs) somewhere. B, I love you. Okay, so East St. Africa. So now a little history. 
or why I said that word. It comes from someone and someone very dear to me. And um, he's a, a, a world-renowned djembe player and dancer and folklorist and choreographer from East St. Louis. His name is um, Babatunde Bulisila, or Buli Babatunde Sila. This gentleman is my one of my senior brothers in the dance company that I was in called um, the East St. Louis Community Performance Ensemble. And through that company is where I met him when I was a young boy around uh, eight years old. And it's from that company that I learned what a djembe was. Before that, I only played folklore Ghanaian music from my father, you know, dealing with Ghanaian drumming. A lot of people got to realize for the listeners that just because a drum is from Africa does not mean it comes from all of Africa or all of West Africa. There's different ethnic groups. There's different countries, there's different dialects. And within every ethnic group and within every country in the continent of Africa, there are many different instruments, drums, and languages. And I say instruments, drums, and languages because those three things are connected. In order to play the instrument, you must be able to learn how they speak the language within that drum or that instrument because they're talking and communicating. So the cool thing is when my father and my mother you know, once you know, you know when the relationship thing go. I came back to the city of my mother, you know, which is East St. Louis. Now, mind you, she grew up here, but her father was from where I live now, New Orleans. So, to come back to the city like East St. Louis and grow up in in a, in a city like that, you know, be a Ghanaian, born, and raised in an amazing city, the great city of East St. Louis. Something happened for me that changed my life when I met this gentleman, Sylvester Sunshine Lee. We had the company, the East St. Louis Performance Ensemble. On my first day that I went there, I met two musicians that was a, a member of that group who also formed his own group called Kumasi Nankama Aswai Kambang, which is the gentleman by the name of Baba Tunde Bulisila and another gentleman by the name of Chamo, Tyrone Chamo Fair, who passed away. At that day, when they saw me walking with the drum, they were like, yo, where, where you from? And where you been? You know how to, you, wait a minute, you playing some other, you playing stick and hand techniques. Folks don't know <laughs> about that, right? So, you know, and so he's like, man, that's what I'm talking about. See, this is real. He was telling his partner, say, this, he, this place right here, this is the real, this is East St. Africa. And I was blown away because I'm like, East St. Africa. And the reason being, there were a lot of African artists coming living in East St. Louis during the time of Catherine Dunham, during the um, 60s, 70s, and really 60s, late 60s, 70s, and the 80s. There were a lot of African artists coming to East St. Louis because of Catherine Dunham, because of um, East St. Louis Performance Ensemble, because of uh, Kumasi Nankama, that's why I come back. All these different dance companies were here and these African artists were coming here making a living in the hood, in the community where, you know, where at that time there was nobody, you know, there was a lot of folks outside of African-Americans. There were none that was playing folklore. So it was little Africa. So every time he would talk about East St. Africa, we refer to the area we grew up in because we lived an African lifestyle within the and within East St. Louis. You had these kids eating Yasa, Chebujin, and stuff because the people like Khatab Susoko, like the people Morcham, who was the father of Akon, who used to live in East St. Louis. Um, Zach Juice, rest in peace. Papa Abdullah Kamara, rest in peace. Um, Pagai, um, Ibrahim Pagai Kamara, rest in peace. All these are great, amazing African artists were living along as well as my father was living in East St. Louis, but giving this back to you, giving it back to the children. A lot of different ways of different areas. It would be crazy during certain times. They had all these different, these different uh, dance companies in different areas. Like in the Griffin homes, they had the um, Santu uh, and the uh, John the Seals area. They had the, uh, the uh, what, uh, uh, um, Alalake, all these different areas had different African dance companies in Mal and, but was able to speak and sing in Malinke Mandane in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. 
So that's why when we refer to East Saint Africa, we would it was his words he would always refer to that city as East Saint Africa because of the African presence, because of the huts you see over there in the middle of East St. Louis on 18th Street, you see huts that was built by Catherine Dunham. And uh, I think a certain, I forgot who the, who the uh, architect was, who built these huts in this area by her museum. And you would see these huts and you would see certain people who are very spiritualist of that area would put shrines, traditional shrines in there. This is where it would get deep, where you were like, oh, this is only, you could only find this in Africa. And he was like, I'm telling y'all, and you always, I'm telling you, baby, he say Africa, he say Africa. So I always hear that growing up, he say Africa. So I say, you know what? I always have to talk, you know, I always talk about Ghana. I always talk about, you know, Africa, but also I have to talk about Africa within America. And when I first grew up around it, seeing it outside of a contextual base of it being in continental Africa, but being in my backyard. And so right. when he would say East St. Africa, I was to always dig that. And he, I, he was proud of it. He was proud of it. So I always get praise. And it always, what I say one day, I'm going to shout that, that word out. East St. Africa. And yeah. I thought it would be perfect to do because it blends what I'm really representing, the African and American experience, not the African American experience, the African and American experience. Because there's no way you could take a group of people and not realize you are who you are. You never take an elephant and put him in the, uh, uh, into the Bronx Zoo and he's been there, the, ele the African elephant that's been there for 30 years and call it an African-American elephant. It is what it is, you know what I'm saying? Right. As a lot of the time, we, we know, it's, I'm proud to be what I am, but that's just fact. You don't take a lion from them the middle of, of the Gambia and bring him to them... Brazil and they go not gonna he's been there for 30 and they gonna call him Afro you know not African Brazilian you know he call it that that's what people say but that's what's the way I feel that's just me that's just me so it is representing the being who we are and bringing the voice of what we are to be what it is that's what we call East Saint Africa. Oh man, I love it and yeah, it's it's such a perfect name for what you've created like musically to place it geographically somewhere because like you're mm -hmm. of both places and and so is east saint africa so when yeah. i heard that i did a little prowling and, and some interviews that you had done to try to get an understanding for it and I, yeah i just love it and I, I love the etymology and the history like how you heard it as a youth and how you yeah. sort of repurposed it in the current context yeah, I had to find a talk a way to talk about East St. Louis, but and, and, and really talk about the history of the djembe even in America. There was only two places you could find djembe in America, and that's New York and East St. Louis. In the when the djembe first hit America, there was only two places you can see it: New York, East St. Louis. And everybody said I'm lying. There's no pictures of anything outside of that time. Maybe in the '60s, late '60s. Early '70s, when the gym base started moving into the in the, um out outside of this the banks, because people had to come to East St. Louis to study the folklore. If you were from the Midwest or from the West, you were coming here. Yeah, you were coming here. You were coming here. There were a lot of people. The East St. Louis at that time was one of the meccas of folklore culture. To me, it still is. Whether people are like, well, you go to New York, and which is did New York is a great place. DC is a great place. LA is a great place. Uh, 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 New Orleans is a great place, but at a time, as far as the folkloric artists that were in America, there were two places you had to go. Here, in New, I went limit here, but in East St. Louis and in New York. Because of gotcha. people like Catherine Dunham, because of people like Harry Belafonte, because of people like Pearl Primus, because of people like Chief Bay, because of people like uh, um, Mordechai. Um, Zachariah Juice, Ibae, passing the rest in peace. Yeah. I didn't know that that was the only two places you could find. Them. And it makes sense why it became such a mission for you because you it was so obscure at that time that you probably felt called to plant seeds. Well, yeah, but at the time, by the time it got down, by the time I got to East St. Louis, by the time I got nine or 10, Jimmy was everywhere. By that time, it okay. was every, everywhere. Because you got to realize, um, 
by the 80s, Jimbe was everywhere. I mean, you had in Oakland, New York, LA, Indiana. And the, 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 the understanding of what the Jimbe was to the community, you got to realize there was a time where Jimbe, African music and African drum and dance was a form of regaining self-awareness of being African. It wasn't about everybody coming together into a drum circle. Drum circles came later when the influx of different people who were either studies of like Baba Ola Tunji and different people studying folklore during the, the grateful, the time of the, the dead or folklore, like when Ola Tunji would open up the dead and the drum circle whole time thing came in. When our people get together, like we're here tonight to give thanks to the creator for providing us with plenty, plenty to eat, plenty to drink, and plenty to wear. Yeah, yeah. But most important, to give thanks for life. Yes! That you, 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 you and I, that we are alive today. Let me hear. So through the music. And that was late 80s. Yeah. Early 90s. You didn't see, like I said, it was only people who were born into folklore who were African American Africans who were playing this music and doing this because it was it was it was an awareness of, of African people regaining us us understanding of history and folklore and culture and self. You know what I'm saying? And not to sound weird, but it was the truth. You didn't see that white Jimmy players and white grandmas at that time. You didn't see it. So there was a, probably a couple of people that was very uh, allowing. Because in order for you to allow, you had to have the hugest respect. Because you got to realize, look at the 60s. Hell, look at the 40s. Hell, look at slavery. So you're looking at all that shit. And the finally time when an instrument comes to a country, which has never came, it didn't go. Because at the time, it was still like, quote unquote, the derogatory term. It was the beginning of jazz music. Like our jazz was... Uh, the word jazz is the regulatory term. Right. Same with djembe folders. At a time, oh, you yeah? wouldn't see a djembe folder. Yeah. We was the last ones hired and the first ones fired. The quote unquote percussionists. Right. You know what I'm saying? You wouldn't see a djembe folder unless they were hip or they understood what was it about. So shout out to people like Chief Bay. Shout out for people like uh, um, uh, Max Roach. Shout out to people like uh, who else? Roy Haynes. All these people was was getting heavy into the stuff. Heavy, 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 yeah. heavy, heavy. Art right, Blakey was heavy, which yeah. did an African album. So you know, I was going to ask about that because I heard you mention that uh, Jembe Fola is not just Baba Olutanji, but also Art Blakey. It. Or at least that's what you're, you as a Jembe Fola are embracing. Yeah, both. I'm embracing. The thing is, Ola Tunji was one who in, was able to introduce folkloric African music from an African American perspective to the world. A lot of people don't want to look at what it was. Ola Tunji, and I'm, I'm going to make it all make sense. Just, just let me show you. Ola Tunji in the 60s created his Drums of Passion, right? And everybody knew Drums of Passion was created by an African man, right? But guess who helped him orchestrate and write a lot of this music? African Americans. It was Chief Bay. People are, uh, uh, like uh, Tao Duval, uh, Montego Joe. If you look at all these uh, or artists who were studying folkloric music, but also regaining an understanding of self, and through that, through that, you hear the songs like, um, like the songs he knew, because he could speak Yoruba. So all those people creating, he was a drummer, but he didn't grow up as a drummer. He went to Morehouse. 
He went to Morehouse. And so when he went to New York, by the time he got to New York and he saw people understand he would implement these different genres of music, black music into what he was doing. But then he got the guys who understood the folkloric aspect of it, which was the gentlemen I name and some of the ladies I, I name. They were the ones who created the, the true foundation of what Olatunji is, was, and will forever be. The whole orchestral, when you hear um, uh, Drums of Passion, was all because of Percy the Chief Bay. Okay? So, was, uh, was Ola Tunia Jim Bay Fuller? No. But he was a person who understood the, the, logist, the, the linguistic terminology of what the drum brings to the forefront of modern music. It was the first album to get that many sales, folkloric sales, in America. Over like over a million records sold in the 60s, early 60s to be exact, maybe the mid-60s. So now, when that was created, the next album implemented a musician by the name of Papa Lodge Compton, Jimmy player, who's from Guinea. So now the Jimmy started to have a voice in the music. Another Jimmy player was creating a voice in the music as well, which was more charm but he created an album called Drums of Fire. So now, the Jimbe is starting to make his voice in the conceptual world, as well as the folkloric world. But at the same time, they wanted to be able to, and this is why what I'm doing now is nothing but what they have done and what my father has done, and, and, and being on their backs, or whose shows I stand on. Because they were the ones who think outside of the box with the folkloric, uh, uh, folkloric way of life and folkloric voicing with the instruments. So when there's people like the, when those people were able to do that, yeah, it was cool, but it was starting to make a move. It was making a move during a special time because this new renaissance of black culture started to come in alive in the arts. Yeah. So it was strong, but it was strong and strong, but something happened where it was in the communities. It was in the community strong, so strong where they were starting to get grant funding to keep those, those, those things going. So throughout the years, the, the community was growing strong. So that's why you were able to get different dance companies, East St. Louis Performance Ensemble. That's why you were able to get uh, Alayo. That's why you were able to get International Drum and Dance Ensemble. That's why you were able to get Kumpo West African. That's why you were able to get Jamano Kura in the West Coast. That's why you were able to get Sundance. All of these different groups were able to, to do that because of the funding that was coming to the communities that they were able to preserve and maintain this, these things that keep going. So I'm saying that to all the state is that the people like Ola Tunji, yes, they were able to preserve folklore culture in a modern context. Yes, Art Blakely did an album where he was able to do that with those same musicians that I named for Ola Tunji's album on his album. Because he understood, though those musicians weren't just understanding folklore music, they also was understanding how to make folklore music going to the future to give it to people who wasn't hip to what was happening, what being proud to be African and saying this is a new sound that is coming out. And throughout the thing, some things slow down and die down. But it's always been people like Channel Pozo with Dizzy, um, Chief. They were able to make a way, but once that way was created, it was only at a certain time and it stayed still like this. And then the songs became everlasting historic songs. But the treatment of the musician was doing like this. So then when you start looking at um, albums done by the 70s and you saw the word conga play, you see a lot of conga players in the 70s. And they write on congas with Ohio players, on congas with Earth, Wind & Fire. You didn't see the word percussionist until later in the game, right? And the reason being because a lot of those guys referred to their instrument as what it was. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Is what it, of what it truly was. 
They referred to it as what it truly was. And when they referred to it, what it truly was, folks was like, I got to have this. Whether the person was a good player or not, but they were trying to open up this new sound, which is cool. Because it was only four percussionists or hand drummers who made it in the industry who had great record deals. Big Black. Bill Summers. To me, can't be right. Coming down, taste you in my mind and spread you all around. Here I am. Oh, this love's for you. Hey, baby, sweet as honey, too. And she leaves. I don't know who else, but those four I know for a fact right. were four hand drummers who got deals, who had hits on the radio because they were drummers. Now, everybody out of that, outside of that, was working their job as being a you know percussion hand drummer, etc. But at the same time, that died down. So when you had cats playing congas and you had some guys playing Jimmy in the bands. It died down to where you need to do X, Y, and Z. You can be a folklore drum. So the look of what I always say, let's desegregate the drum, it came in for me, always being the last one's hired and the first one's fired. Yeah. And understanding that we have to use that these words that we always use are very important when we when we try to evolve, evaluate, and understand the situation is that we tell a person, I'm saying I'm a Jimbe Fola, and then you say, well, yeah, our um, percussionists. I'm, I'm like, okay, cool. But like I always tell people, there's no way a European vernacular can define an African narrative. It's, in, it's impossible. Right. So, of course, I'm saying that I'm a Jimbe Fola. You're saying I'm a percussionist. Yes, you see me here with a Jimbe and a Congo. You do not see me with an array of things. But because you would feel like this is a percussion a percussion instrument because of the definition of what it is in a European vernacular, then it changed my narrative of what it truly is, which is incorrect. Because I would not, I dare to tell anybody to say that because on drums, so and so, so and so, on piano, so and so, so and so, and on percussion, we the brain. So that's like me saying on percussion, Robert Glasper, on percussion. Chris Dave and a percussion yeah. weedy brain muscle. But we won't say that because the terminology of what a percussionist is is all three of those things. All three of those yeah. things. But because the wording of it, the subjugates is always to be you're this, you're this, and you're that. I am the drummer, you're the percussionist, know your role. Instead of saying you're a drummer because we speak two of the same, we may say, speak two different narratives we speak the same language. And the problem is we have to desegregate that mentality for the future because now times are changing. My album, um, Bali Maya's album, Christian's Project, all these different things are app changing. Well, the djembe is no longer called the percussion instrument because we're looking at the European terminology to define what we're doing. And, that, and I, I, I dare you to say what I just said was a lie because if it was, you wouldn't call me, you know, now it's changing. Now they call me a Jimmy Fuller, but you know, but that's what I'm going back to say about those times in the seventies because of the people like Ola Tunji, because of people like Chief Bay, because of people like Art Blakely, and plus people like Lodge Gabriel and Boy Chama. They were the ones to able to define their narrative and have it told that these drums have a legacy to them. So we must define and speak and show and tell the true truth behind them. If not, what will happen in the future will be a disgrace, which has happened. That's why you have so many guys that are able to play quote unquote percussion 
but they're not able to talk about the folklore and sentiments that come with the instrument that it comes from. <laughs> you know, that's tough, man. Uh, uh, you very, stated it in a way that obviously made a ton of sense, but also it's emotional. It's like, who are Europeans or Westerners to rewrite your history in our words or place labels on what you do to fit our compartmentalized yeah. music? But it's also in all realms. It's not just, you know, the European terminology, but you got to realize that terminology often also been taught to people who are direct descendants of the music. So you start seeing folks that's like, you know, you see, you know, seeing certain people um, saying, okay, yeah, man, you know, go do this hip hop thing, but we need you on percussion. Cool. All right. So I'll do this. I'll get a array of things that represents a percussionist. Shakers. Snare, timpani, bells, not bells, because I'm like, because they use bells, um, chimes, maybe some other type of things that represents that. And that's cool. That's fair. But the moment you tell me to add a djembe, because it's, you know, X, Y, and Z, okay, fine. But here's the deep thing. If I just had a djembe and a conga and the gentleman to the right of me has a snare, cymbals, kick drum, um, tum-tum, all the individual instruments that make up a percussionist, but I have a drum, it's simply a djembe, and we don't say the name of the instrument, but on the percussion. It immediately devalues what it is. Yeah. It's like, okay, it's just that. When this has a name, it's like saying, I hate to say it like this. It's damn near like saying Kuta Kinte calling him Toby. Yeah. It's, it's deep to say because when we don't look at it like that, but it's exactly what it is. The instrument is there. The European narrative say it's a percussion. Me as a djembe full of say it's a djembe. No, it's not that. It's a percussion. On percussion. And everybody say I'm lying. How can you fight a Europe? Once again, you cannot define what well, we speak English in the West. Yes, you do. But we also have them different. We also have restaurants over here from Thailand. We have restaurants over here from <laughs> so we don't go and say X, Y, and Z. That I want the damn X, you know. I'm just that's how I look at yeah. it. That's how I look at it. You know, it's a double standard for sure. It's a double standard, you know, and with what I believe. I'm trying to change that double standard, you know what I'm saying? And of course, you know, it's not gonna happen in in in, in the year's time, maybe two years, but I pray that change happens. They, you know, what people are like, oh, you know, my bad. Jimbe, can we turn the Jimbe up? Or uh, say, you know, saying, saying, turn the percussion up. Cause you know, that happens in the in the music world when you're on stage. And me and Bill Summers talked about this a lot. You will be on stage and say, like, you know, you know, co folks were like, you know, can we get your toys? I'm like, what's the toys? Your shakers and your belts. Get your, get your toys. Yeah, that devalues it so much. It's like, like, exactly. like it's for children who don't know any better. Think about it like this. I've seen it. That's why if you ever listen to my album, if you listen to the album, there's a skit on there called Bongo G, which <laughs> encompasses all of this, yep. of the things I went through. The djembe drum is not a bongo. It's a gamba-shaped drum from West Africa that comes from the Manding ethnic group in the countries of Mali, Guinea, Senegal, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, and Sierra Leone. I must be still tripping my balls off of acid Me too. or ayahuasca. Is that like a fucking bongo genie? Gnarly. Anyway, man. Fun fact. Did you know that in the 60s, Chief Bay was the first to construct iron rings for the djembe drum? I'm smoking on that weed no more. I did it in a drum, uh, uh, in a music store. I did it in a music store. Mm -hmm. And I had the drummers in the back just banging away because that's what happens. You see those drums, you bang away. If you don't understand what they are, you can do what you want. A parent sees their child in a, in a, in a music uh, store. The child wants to play the piano, bang on the piano. The teacher or the parent or the owner says, don't do that. Why don't you go play on that drum? Bang on that drum. See if you have rhythm. So and, and instead of saying, why don't you sit somewhere and learn how to play? Of course, the child going to bang and do certain things on anything. 
But don't immediately change the subject mind to be like, immediately go there. When the child's clearly trying to play a piano to understand what it is, or even bang on it. But the thing is, because that has value, this doesn't. And I tell people, we have to realize the things we say in front of children because they're going to show that. That's why the word bongo is such, I, I laugh at it because everyone compared it to a bongo. Same with you, maybe a chora, you know, get the guitar. It's like all these type of things we have to look at. Has to change. So if I'm here and I'm hated for saying these things, I don't give a shit because I live by it. You do. I live by it. it you don't just live by it, but you teach it through the music. Exactly. I mean, exactly. besides besides what we're talking about here, all the stuff you're telling me is in the music. You know, from the skits to the history and and yeah, I just wanted to get some foundational stuff before we got into the music for myself, for the listeners, because I mean, it's an ambitious project, The Hands of Time. There's a lot of hundreds and really thousands of years, but at least 500 years of history in that record. Uh, the journey, the, uh, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, pan-African experience, and then what you described as the African-American experience which not to be confused with african-american all mm -hmm. that is it's a it's a lot you know and and especially in this time period where people are learning about race in a way that we didn't before um and it's important to have a document like this record to kind of guide the educational journey to guide your emotional experience um or I'll speak for myself um because, you know, there's a lot of noise out there and there's a lot of anger and that's not what's here. This is storytelling. I mean, sure, there's plenty of anger, righteous indignation. But as you've stated in the past, like Africans make joyful, uplifting music in times of, of need and distress. Africans around the world, Black folks around the world make music because it's one of the things that was taught in traditional context to focus on emotion, spirit, and awareness. You know, when you think about the power of what it takes to do those things, you start looking at what it is to create. That's why certain music are so profound because you don't realize how the hell can someone make something when they're going through X, Y, and Z. Hell, proof is in the pudding. For years and years and years, you know. I want to talk about the music in particular, like the, mm -hmm. the songs on the record, the players. Mm -hmm. um, you just referenced about making music when you're going through something. So uh, I know uh, this is a heavy one to start with, but uh, when clouds kiss. Oh, uh, hey, yeah. I mean, it doesn't get any heavier than that, uh, and but also more beautiful, more human. Uh, can you, yeah. if you wouldn't mind, yeah, explain I don't, I don't the mind. genesis I don't of mind. that song? And that's exactly what it is. It's the, it's the, it was the, that song, actually that time period was a very unique time period in my life. That's when things start moving in a direction that I always wished for them to move. I was, at that time, I was touring with the Nth Power. Um... I was still in St. Louis. I had um, a band I created, which was one of my first albums I did, was an EPK, Creative Pandemonium with Great K that I created with a bunch of amazing artists, amazing musicians in St. Louis. It was a 14 piece band, right? Huge folkloric fusion band, right? <laughs> and so all these things were happening and I was trying to find my way and doing all these things. So I came back from LA and uh, I talk about this because there's two things that, that if you listen to the album, that's when the clouds kiss, there's sin for me, and then there's ships come in, they come all back to back because it's a trilogy. Mm -hmm. So in actuality, on January the... Actually, I'm lying. On February the 2nd, 1st, February the 1st, I went to go visit my mom in St. Louis. She's a great musician. She will forever be a great drummer and my greatest teacher. And it's all dealing with, you know, when the clouds kiss. So 
I went by to visit her and she, I was like, all this shit is happening in my life. And I said, you know what? I said, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to move to New Orleans. Now, mind you, my Uncle Idris, everybody on my grandfather's side, you know, is Homer. It's like, it's the most Southern African area west of the continent. You know what I'm saying? You know, so I'm like, I say, well, hell, I'm going to do that. So I'm like, I don't want to tell my best friend. I still live in St. Louis. Go to visit her in East St. Louis. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go tell her. So right before I told her, I say, mama, you know, some cool things was happening. She said, I say, I got something I want to talk to you about. She said, well, before you talk to me about it, let's go. I'm going to go to the corner store. Get me a pack of Sailor Wines. So I'm in the car and I said, Mama, how would you feel if I moved to New Orleans? You know, I'm never here, but I'm always a road. And her words were sin for me. And I'm like, huh? She said, Yeah, we sin for me. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready. I'm ready. Matter of fact, I'm ready to start that plan again, really cooking, really ready to do my thing. I was like, what? She said, I said, you see it. I said, Mama, let's do an album. And then he was like, yeah, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. So I said, cool. So the next day, on the second, no, I'm sorry. It was the second. On the third, I wrote on Facebook, all right, guys, she agreed to do it. I took a picture of my mother. This is like February 3rd. I took a picture with her, and I was like, look, she agreed to it. We're going to do this album. Everybody had so many hints. Everybody having like, wow, go ahead, and we're going to do this. It's going to be great. We're looking forward to this. February 4th, she had a stomach ache. And February 5th, I called the phone. She didn't answer. She didn't answer. Knocked on the door and didn't answer. And I'm feeling weird. And so I go, and my auntie walked and opened the door, and there she was. She, was, she had passed away. And that was February 5th, 2015, in the cloud kiss. That's why I did Sin For Me after that. Because I wanted to know when I did this album, it wasn't just an album for me. It was an album in recognition of her and my father. But joyly for her, because she knew what she was doing. She had a, she knew the work she was doing, both on this side of the water and on the other side of the universe. She knew. And she told me, you know, before she passed, she said, you know, our ship don't come in. with me. She told me that. And that's why I did all three of those back to back for her. So when you talk about when the clouds kiss, I wanted to create a movement or an emotion that was going to represent hurt, sadness, but happiness. If you listen to the song, it's basically her. It's a, basically the emotion was me and the family and and the emotions sad, but another side was happy. So right when the, 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 the emotion changed from the physical world to the, to the metaphysical world, I wanted to create a sound that can, people could be like, what the hell is this? I can feel the change. I can feel the change of a person seeing somebody that they have not seen and they're gone, and them wanting them to like, yo, you about to be with us, and me fighting for it. Because if you listen, I play my djembe, and I hit the hell out, like, bah, because I'm hurting. Mm. But those, the voices are two forms of voices, both the seen voices of the physical and the metaphysical, of us being able to cross this other journey, and how do I take musicians to go, and how do I take people to listen to a song and take it to a journey? So, funny story about that. I was in the studio, and um. I had to shout out my engineer and the one who mixed the album, Mr. Keenan McCray. We were fighting, like, and we was like, this song was dear. He's like, and he was like serious about making it right. And he says, almost there, but it's not perfect. And I'm like, bro, it's there. 
because to him, perfect is not right. It's, perfect is a different thing than what I think perfect was because I was going through the emotion. I said, I'll tell you what, I said, I'm going to bring three students in here, young kids, children, 16, 17, to listen. Their response of what it is is going to be if we need to fix it or if it's perfect. So we argued. He would always say, I got to go smoke a cigarette. So he'd go outside. So the little kids was in there, and they listened. And as they listening, I asked them at the end, it was just the three of us. It was actually, yeah, the three of us. Two kids and me. And I asked them, I said, so guys, what do you feel? And the one kid, it was tears as I said, I'm scared to talk about what I feel because it's like someone passed away and they're happy. But oh, the person, well, and, but the people we're listening to is but like, but somebody said, I said, that's what you hear. But I had this serious mad face because I'm trying not to break down crying. I'm not, I'm not trying not to break down the cry. So I said, okay, you, it feels like, yeah, I feel exactly. It's like something gone but the beauty about it is that they they're watching over you that they're pushing you i said okay i said that's what you hear i said you sure that's what you hear it's like somebody passed away i said okay so i said remember what you said so then he comes in i say he says yeah bro let's work on this man i feel it's almost there i say stop before you do anything i said um can y'all tell him what you just i asked you what the song was about yeah man i, I really feel I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, can I step outside? I say, no, before you step outside, tell him what you feel. And he told him. And I feel like someone passed away and the emotion of their body leaving and the family is hurt, but they're watching over them. And then he's re entered the other guy, he re entered this. And Keenan sat there with his mouth dropping. He says, he says, wow. And so he said, Mr. Weedy, what, what's the song about? And Keenan started, he just laughed, he said, this moment he, you know, he found his mother, his mother had passed. And I had to walk out to him and I started crying. And it was at that moment, they was like, oh, we should. And then Keenan was like, we're done. We got the songs. Yeah. 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 So that's three songs. And then with Tank and Pedrito, well, how they did that, it was like, that song was so intense, was sent for me. To this day, I, I, I I can never stop thinking Tank. I always tell her that. I say, I can't stop thinking. She's like, shut up, boy. But I, it was the most powerful thing I could see somebody reenact. A person they didn't know, but to the T. It's a really powerful that part of the record in general is so it's just a, it's emotional and and it translates and you were able to find folks like Tank like Pedrito among others to you know plug into that emotion for you. I think I think what it is be what it truly is is that everyone on this album every person on this album from the guest to my band. And I always like to say, without my band, I'm nothing. By the hands of time, I'm nothing. But every person understands three things, emotion, music, and spirit. Mm -hmm. And all of them are conduits of all three of those things. They are a, they conduits of their emotions and emotion. They are a conduit of music and bring them and breathe the music through them. And they're all conduits of spirit because they're all coming from some form of folkloric connection, whether it's from the New Orleans, Afro New Orleanian culture, Af um, the African traditional folkloric African culture, Afro Cuban culture, but they are connected to spirit. Yeah. Does Castle can play their asses off? Like, play. Get this play any instrument. 
But there's also people who know how to bring spirit. And when they play, they know this is deeper than what you think this is. And this is higher than whatever you think you would go for any type of uh, 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 herb. or any, This is beyond that. This yeah. is beyond that. And those musicians know the vocabulary, the vocabulary of how to bring spirit down. And that's why this album is what it is. It's not like I just got a bunch of my friends to play. I'm connected to those people because I'm they're connected to spirit. And if you're a spiritual people or a, a spiritual person, you know how to connect people to spirit. That's why Trombone Shorty is who he is. Because not only is he a player, he's connected to spirit. Christian Scott is connected to spirit. Corey Henry is connected to spirit. Tank is connected to spirit. Moo Moo Fresh is connected to spirit. You know, Corey Henry is connected to spirit. Pedro Martinez, we come from the world of how to play for spirit. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, in the hands of time, everybody grew up and are studiers and students of what it is that represents that. So that band were the, the band, the band that has a time, Raja Kasi, Sam Dickey, Munir Zaki, Luke Coranta, Sheik and Ndoy, um, Shea Pierre, Courtney Smith. Those musicians are people who are not just conduits of spirit because they play the music. Their genres, their lines of where they studied and they lived and they endured and consumed what this is about has graduated them to the next level of spiritual awareness, awakening that the average musician would never know about. I was going to ask about a bunch of those cats. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm good friends with Luke for many years. Oh, that's my man. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's where I stay when I come to New Orleans. And he, him and his lady, Joanna, are very Joanna, kind yeah. to us. You know, so, yeah. so I got to kind of experience the beginnings of this project you know, hearing him talk about it, his energy, him, you know, I came to a couple shows, like I said, back in 2018. So watching the evolution of the hands of time, not just the album, but the collective, the mission, like what did you identify uh, in like those musicians that, you know, let's say the ones that are not of, you know, uh, African tradition, um, because I know you have a lot of African players on your record too. What did you look for in people uh, on the, obviously you already stated like a spiritual connection, but musical vocabulary, right. like how, how do you select? That's a great question. Um, basically, every person have in this group has um, took in their life and took in their life to be connected with the music. And not just with, you know, a mu this, this, a genre of music, but I'm talking about this folkloric music. So, of course, all of us play in different bands. We play in different, um, I don't know, different settings. But the deep part about it is, these are the musicians who always want to play the music they, they love and hear in the different the settings they're in. Like good example, Sam Dickey mm -hmm. is a it will be it will go down in history as a legend because what he's been able to do with folkloric music, but in the context where he's playing jazz, blues, funk, hip hop, etc. Because when you get gigs to play one genre of music, you always throw in what you what your love is. And you want to see what the connection of the musicians and the people and what pulls what you're trying to do out of them to see what they are able to do, what you're able to do with the music. Because we could just ting a ling a ling a ling. But if I start throwing certain bajaru leaks in there or suku's licks or certain things in, in conversation with the licks from this different narrative that we play every day, you then start to change the cycle of how people look at a style of music. So people like Munir Zaki, who's able to play, who's a djembe fola to the top tier, but also able to play hip hop and create hip hop and be a producer, but to implement what he knows from his world he grew up in, in those genres. Same with Courtney Smith, who comes from the gospel world, who was 
you know, one of the pianists inside the Inf Power. Yeah. He was in, he was an original member of my band, KP. So he was studying African music from a whole different side. And then they go to start playing, be the Inf Power be his first touring band, to start playing funk and, you know, fusion. But then having those conversations with him and say, yo, man, if we did this like this, man, this would be, the, the world wouldn't understand. We were like, man, it would be different. But I would love to see the reaction. Raja Cassis, who is one of the greatest Mbalak guitarists and understanding of traditional Mbalak music, Senegalese conversations and narratives, and who's taking his time to study with people who grew up in this narrative. He's able to speak both. I mean, he's incredible. He's a, to play with like, you know, bands like, um, like, um, uh, the big uh, uh, Afrobeat band. Um, let's say their name. Auntie Ballas. Auntie Ballas, as well as his own group, The Human Being. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And It's like he understands how to bring those two narratives together. The thing is, if you don't know how to bring certain voices together and make them fit, not just saying I'm going to play this style of music with this and we're going to create a sound, no, to how to marry them. Yeah. That's what this group is about, is how can I get a group of people to marry who I am as a person? That takes relationship. Sure. So I have an emotional and a close relationship with every member of the band, from Shea Pierre, Courtney Sith, Munir Zaki, Lou Caranta, um, Sheikh Ndoy, uh, Sam Dickey. All of those people I have a close relationship to because they're able to play in different arenas, but their main are arena is trying to push the sound and the preservation of this music to the forefront. So I couldn't just call this a badass, I had to find somebody who understood me, who had a relationship with me, who, you know, who, who, who was emotional, emotionally tangible to what I was trying to convey as a musician. And all these people, we've cried together, we've ate together, we've argued together. And so it's a connection about this that a lot of times when people say, well, you know, I want to play this type of music. Well, we, 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 we laugh because I'm like, OK, we've got to play certain genres of music because if we don't, sometimes we won't get paid. But those same musicians can't come to this side unless you study it. These people mm -hmm. took their life to study it. You know what I'm saying? And for the ones who doesn't study, but like, good example. Shea Pierre is undoubtedly probably one of the greatest pianos I've, pianos I've ever worked with. Unreal. But Shea was able to understand rhythms, timings, melodies and chords and harmonies that are so amazing that his mind will go anywhere any musician in the band will go. And that's not easy. Not growing up in it. But growing up in it because he was raised in New Orleans. So those musicians that I had in my immediate band were the only people who could have brought my dream to life. The only ones. The only ones. And they've worked with everybody, but at the same time, it's all the same. It's the same thing saying, how do we find a way to bring an idea who, from a person who believes in three things? Music is imitation, emulation, and innovation to the forefront. Amazing. Yeah. I, you know, of course, it makes sense. You have to have the relationships, the time to build, understand who you are, your vision. Uh, and then, of course, speak the language of the music, spiritual connection, intention, and everybody you named. I mean, I'm most familiar with Raja and Luke and Sam because they're friends of mine and I've been following their stuff for mm -hmm. years. But uh, there's something about the unit and what y'all are able to create together live and on record. It puts you in your own lane 
forget genres yeah, man. and categories. It's it's a unique musical project mission. It's like a life mission. It's a cultural mission. And like, you know, I'm a white guy who grew up in New Jersey and like I'm emotionally connected to this through the passageway that you and the hands of time have opened for me. It's been a battery in my back to know more, to study more, to listen more. And, and you know, that's just a credit to what you've been able to create here. And, and I think that a lot of us, when I say us, Americans, white folk, need it explained. You know, we could put on your record and hear this amazing, beautiful music and even plug into the emotions, but to know the depth of the intention and the ancestral lineage, um, it takes it out of just entertainment and what Karis one called edutainment, edutainment, education. It's edutainment, it's ed 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 edutainment, exactly, edutainment, yeah. And, it's actually exactly what it is, yeah. And I just wanted to recognize that outside of just art, man, it's it's history and and important to me and I, that's why I wanted to like hear you tell it in in these terms because I yeah. think it's important for people to understand beneath the surface it's it, it's it's intenseful because the intent behind it is that everybody in the band has a certain goal of reaching something that's going to be very unique and all of these guys are, you know I, I must say all of them are producers of their own right Shake and Doy Courtney Smith, Munir Zaki, you know what I'm saying? And I must say, there was, there, there, all of these people play key roles in, in my project, or our project, because when, when we first did this, the band was like, okay, so we're going to do these songs. And I said, <laughs> I never forget, we had five songs in the can already. Five, yeah, five, six songs in the can. So the other songs, they was like, so what, what else are we going to do? We done, right? I said, no, we far from. And so when I said, I'm going to watch what do we do next, they thought I was crazy. And that's the idea. I say, we can only, if we can reach beyond what's reachable as a band leader, as a Jimmy Fuller being a band leader and musicians who are playing a genre of music that I don't even think has been, it has, has a name yet, which I don't want to name it. It's not easy. You know, it's not easy, but the ride we took to create this album and the response of it has been overwhelming. Overwhelming. You know, overwhelming with, you know, I mean, with all the things that the things that go with it. But I, my main goal is, and my main prayer is that the listener is able to try to find a way to try to learn more, feel more, see more, and try to know more what's happening in this world. So, yeah, and I mean, not just the world of music, but the world of what it is that we're trying to convey to people. So when you ask questions like this, B, about the history of the folklore, the history of this, and these interviews that, I, that I'm doing with you, it changes the narrative of what people will see about who I am as a person, a musician, and as a, uh, as a leader, and as well as the band members. That's why I say their names with pride. With pride, because once again, they have their own projects, all of them. Yeah. All of them. And they're powerful projects and powerful albums and powerful ideas and ideologies and all that. But it was this album to really show that we're not just here to do one thing, but there were many voices and many understandings that's going to be able to convey a certain, certain new future for what this instrument and this styling of music will be doing. Because I pray that Jimmy Fowlers are able to create albums and now people were like, oh, who is this? Or the albums that have dropped. Well, wh who is a Mama Decatur? Who is an Adama Dharma? Who's a Sungalo Kulibata? Who is a, you know, Farafina Khan Jr.? Who are these different groups that are here? Who is it a Tebow Rory? Who's a Maget File? Who is a Amadou Kuyate? You know what I'm saying? This is important. Yes. This is truly important. So if all of this is driving for me to do that. It, it's, I mean, it's astounding, you know, and it gives people more to dig into, more music to study where you open the door and then we find the originals or we hear stuff that inspired you. Exactly, um, Ex exactly. Uh, we've been going for like an hour, man, and I appreciate it. Uh, are we do? are we, do you got time for two or three more? You can have time for as much as you want, brother. Uh, I appreciate it. I wanna, I wanna take a quick detour. I'll, 
come back to hands of time, but early in the conversation, you referenced how like Baba Olutanje uh, collaborating with the Grateful Dead was something that opened up a whole generation to something they wouldn't have known about or experienced. And True. I can draw a straight line from that. Cause I mean, I got to see the dead at, at the end of their career when Garcia was still alive, but uh, not Olutanje. Um, mm. So for me, you joining the nth power and me being so connected to that music and that band. Mm. I mean, I knew who you were and I probably would have called you a percussionist back then, frankly, because mm -hmm. I didn't know any better. Right. I wrote that down even. Yeah. Um, no, that's fine. Yeah, I get it. I'm just saying like that. The That's the beginning of my journey with you. You know, Hell, the nth power always used to call me a percussionist. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what I'm saying is, is seeing you on stage with them, making that music, bringing djembe fola folkloric whether it's the rhythms themselves or just your energy or your vocabulary to contemporary jazz funk fusion r&b something that's accessible for people mm -hmm. like myself and our community the people that go to jazz fest etc mm -hmm. um seeing you in that alchem out like the alchemy of that music hearing you told me you know, I need to know more. I need to follow Weedy mm -hmm. wherever mm -hmm. he goes, right? So you, mm -hmm. in essence, were my Baba Olutanji because seeing wow. you in that context opened the whole door to my, you know, interest in... You know what's I, funny? You know what's funny you said that? One of my good friends told me it was a Tiba Roy, who's the ne the godson of Olutanji. And it was, it was the godson of Olutanji. And the Tiba Roy has a group called Africa Unplugged, amazing band, amazing musician, amazing, amazing player. And we was talking about that. He says, bro, you essentially did what Baba did. But for me, when I got to play with, when I was traveling with Ince Power, we were able to bring that message of love. And it was one of the, it was a very special group. You know what I'm saying? So, and I learned a lot from them. I must say I learned a lot from them. And me, I gave a lot to the group as far as what I, well, who I am as a folklorist. And it opened up their eyes as well. I know that. But one of the things that really was unique for me, along with meeting the Nth Power, was meeting a gentleman by the name of Otiel Burbridge. Not knowing years later he would be working with Dead & Co. And not knowing that years from that, and probably a year or two after that, I would be a part of his project, you know, O'Till in France, you know. Mr. Weedy Brema. But one of the coolest things is that it was like, like you said, it was like, damn, I'm getting closer to trying to do what Baba was doing in the year 2020, uh, 2017, 2018, 2019. You know what I'm saying? But one of my goals is to do that again. And, you know, it'd be cool, you know, if Dead and Co. were able to redo that again, because it's important to talk about, because I can name you some of the great names. Sunjay Dekada. Uh, um, who else? Um, Baba, Arthur Hall, uh, C.K. Gagno, uh, 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 Olori. All of these are people who play with Ola Tunji during the great show of his New Year's Eve show when they opened up for the dead. Now, we're in the year 2022. There needs to be some form of that to come back. Because I can see you showing awareness then. Now that the door has been opened, there should be some form of awareness of that coming back. So Mickey Hart, if you out there listening, Otil knows we should bring that back of Baba's legacy staying alive. Bring back the secret of Adipujus, you know. Bring back this folkloric music, open it up. Not trying to be a plenty to get a gig, but at the same time, to show that that was one of the most important times where folkloric music had opened up a door inside the dead jam band scene.
It was the first. Yeah. It was. Yeah, and I mean, they did other things with like Zakir Hussein. I mean, but Zakir Hussein, and that was down the line. Yeah, that's more when I got hip to it. Was like yeah. that was happening at the in the nineties, and Baba was in. We talking exactly. Baba was in the eighties. Yep. Baba was yeah. in the eighties. So you know, but that's the lineage. You provide that for a lot of us, and you know, I want to give thanks and also let you know that it's working. You know, like obviously, you know, the accolades whether it's the Grammy nomination, Time Magazine, like the cognoscenti, as I like to call them, like the smart music intellectuals, that's one thing. And that's great. And I, I want you to win all the trophies, but it's the people, the, the culture. That that's what is, I'm happy about, bro. Right. That's, that's what it. I'm happy about. And that's where it resonates and stays because there's new awards every year. There's new magazines every year. But it's new culture, shit every year, but, but the culture, exact month. And yeah. that's why I'm happy. I'm like, wow the more we're able to produce and show what this is about, then the more that this, it, 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 we can change. Things can change. Yeah. Views can change. Emotions can change. You know, the process of how that happens can change. So yeah, I must say those were the things, I'm not going to lie, those type of videos used to trip us out. We used to be like, damn, Baba's old playing, uh, playing that big ass stage. I remember watching it. And I remember watching it with one of the guys, Sunjata Keita, who was one of his lead players at the time. A great Jim Bay Fuller from Detroit. And I remember watching it with him and he was telling us about that show. He said, man, Baba was mad at me. And to hear those stories, you know what I'm saying? And then to see all the tunes again, see Baba again, he was like, well, oh, Sunjata, he <laughs> played too much. This friend, I was mad, I was mad, you know? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I mean, he was one of the guys that really made people focus on African music. It's even to this day, I mean, Drums of Passion, The Invocation. You look at these albums and you read the liner notes because we, 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 we're the last age of minor notes. You, 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 did you trip off of that? We're oh, the yeah. last age Trust of the liner readers. readers. You know, if you're in your 43, 44, 43, 44, until... 39, 38, 37 at the late, the youngest, you're the last yeah. of liner note. You're the liner note. I mean, that was that was what I did. That's kind of why I do what I do is reading you go. liner notes. It's like I want to do that's where I studied, you know. It's you get lost in that and it takes you into the music. And yeah, it's a lost art. Yeah, I could lament on that all day, but we are the Absolutely. last generation of that. Um, yeah. And when so, we talk about like the mission, like you know, the the and I didn't mean to cut you off there, but um, no. the mission uh, that you're doing, or I guess you're not doing it was you were chosen, you know, just it, it's yours to to deliver this music, this folkloric cultures to bridge the gap, whatever you, euphemism we're going to use. You have a partner. You, you linked up with somebody equally motivated to this mission and Christian Scott Atunde Ajua. So My I wanted to hear. Friend. Yeah, I wanted to hear how you guys connected and and any kind of like discussions you had or was it yeah. just like did you just know like we're doing this or was it's there funny some... it's really funny so shout out to two very important people shout out to Corey Fonville Butcher Brown yeah a Butcher Brown yeah and shout out to Joe Dyson you know yep maybe uh, those are two phenomenal world renowned world class drummers and um, I actually met Corey Fonville at uh, Swanee. He's playing with Nicholas Payton, I think. And Alvin Ford introduced me. So I missed uh, him. He was like, yeah, we was cool. And I didn't know. I had known about Christian Scott, but I had heard about him. I had known. I was like, okay, cool. Until one day I heard he, he did an album with Folkloric African Music. And I said, what? Mm -hmm. And I heard it. I was like, oh, wow. He put Casa in there. He's putting Casa in And I said, uh-huh. So I'm starting to listen. So then, you know, I heard he was in town. He's going to be at the Maple Leaf. He was, somebody was doing something. He was doing something at the Maple Leaf, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, Joe Dyson was like, uh, I said, um, Joe, um, this cat, he's an old Christian. So he said, yeah, man, I'm going to link up. And so then 
Corey found me hits me up and said, yo, man, you got to meet Christian out of the clear blue. And I said, did you speak to Joe Dyson? He said, no, nah, man. So out of <laughs> nowhere, they both call him at different times. And I get a call. I'm like, hello. He said, yo. Say, yeah. He left me a message because I didn't answer. He says, hey, bro. He said, this is uh, Christian Scott. Um, call him, blah, 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 blah. Like weedy. So I called him back. I say, hey, brother. And one thing about me, I ain't going to be like, oh, too cool for school. I'm the same weedy you mean now. I'm just as happy. I'm like, what's up, man? He, what's up, blood? You all right, blah, blah, blah. He said, well, look, man, I'm coming to New Orleans. Um, I'm doing a, a, new, a new project. It's a tricentennial album. And um, I'm working on the first album. I'd love for you to be down, blah, blah, blah. I said, bro, I've been trying to link for you for years. And he said, man, I've been hearing your name. And I said, yeah, man, well, I'm in the city. I'm actually here for another two weeks. And before I go back on the road, I was going back on the road with the Empire. Now, I think I was going on the road with Shorty. I might have been on the road with Inspire Shorty, one of those. I might have been Bacante. It was one of those three. And so I was like, I'm in town for two weeks. Let's link. So he called me and another friend of mine who was uh, one of my mentors and great friends named Shaka. And we did the project and we were working together and we were reading each other and we would have these talks while we was talking and we could tell that we was on the same page, but you could tell he was still like, you know, trying to find out the movement of the music. And we did the song. It was cool. We kept talking on the phone. He said, hey, man, I'm... What you doing next? I say, I'm coming back to New Orleans and record. You want to hang? Yeah. So we start recording. So we got to talking about life and music. And of course, with me, African culture. So we just start talking and talking, getting deep. And I say, he said, look, Weedy, well, I got this thing coming up at Harlem stage. I would love for, I say, man, you know what, bro? I say, I would love to be a part of this because you're representing and you're doing something that, you know, I've always prayed for in this conceptual, in conceptual music. And this, you know, this jazz music or in this stretch music as he's created. And he says, man, yeah, bro. So I remember we had a conversation in the green room. Come to find out he knew my uncle because I didn't know at the time he was related to Donald Harrison. So then I found out, I say, well, you know, my uncle, he's Idris Mohammed. He said, quit playing. Idris is your uncle? He said, man. Me and my uncle and your uncle was to run together for years, man. He was in Congo Nation with my uncle, blah, blah, blah. And we was like, yo, bro, he says, man, I knew it was something. And from that, it was became a, it became like we would talk every other two days to every day to start talking about life. And he's a very intelligent human, human being, very intelligent. And the ideas about African music and where we wanted to see the music go and the way we wanted people to feel and emotion behind music. And that same thing of talking about innovation, emulation, and imitation. And we just became to the point where I was talking, I felt like I was looking at me and talking to myself, but from another eye of an instrument that I knew about, but I didn't play. And he had the same sentiment about his instrument, how I felt about my instrument and my spirit. And it became a real brotherhood to the point where every time we talked about anything, we'd be like, we talking like, yo, man, Let's do this. And we'll make, now we start talking about joking. We start joking on each other. So now it's like really brotherhood. I'm like, no. Oh. So then we start, you know, I'll never forget the first tour I went on with them was in Europe. And that was it for my conversations and the people. I, I would bring to the show because, you know, the African music world, he was like, damn. It was, with him being who he is in Europe. And so it was like, it was very a special time to the point where we just did like this. And we became true brotherhood. So within the five years of us working and, and, and creating together, something changed. Because the first albums we did were Ruler Rebel, Diaspora, and Emancipation for Procrastination, which ended up getting nominated for a Grammy while yep. I was with them. On that album, that did a song called In the Beginning that I wrote. 
and it was deep. It was my first nomination. So, or, or being on an album that nominated, and I was featured. I'm like, holy shit, this was deep for me. So, we was working on another album at the same time, and Special Recall. And on that album, me and him really went to town. And he gave me this, he, he believed in what I was trying to convey and my, my, for my voice to come out. And that's when I realized what kind of person he was. They became my, my two friends because he, he let me be free with helping him on his vision. And he believed in me to help me with his vision. And that's when I said, that's when I knew coming from a folkloric world that he, he deserved the term chief, not just because it's a cool thing or he comes from the lineage of it, but he took on the characteristics of his uncle and his grandfather from the way he treated people. Coming from being a family of, come from chieftaincy of folkloric African drummers, I understood and I saw that. So that's when I realized this guy, he's not just a special musician because he's has it in his blood, but he also convey, he, he walks with what it is to be in that lineage. So that's why we became, you know, that's really what it is. And we've been tight. And, you know, to be on his label, Stretch Music, along with the Robo Dope, has been amazing. And so, yeah. My man, Mr. Chief Christian Scott of Tunji Agua, Shotokan Nation. story and i love how cosmic those two phone calls from two drummers that didn't even talk to each other maple but leaves. they knew each other but they made it it was, it was weird yeah it was weird man it was I weird you know yeah and if you were to ask me uh, i could pick one one traditional trap set drummer i could have one like it'd be adris he's he's the greatest yeah for me that's my number one and you know i always knew you were related but uh Maybe fill us in a little bit on that connection. Yeah, well, that's my grandfather's youngest brother. Okay. So Weedy being the eldest, and Leo, aka Idris Muhammad, being the youngest. Ten boys is ten siblings, and five of them were drummers. And so, music. I mean, and from all the from the, from. The, Funk world from the straight jazz world because my granddad was a jazz man. He straight ahead swing bebop. That was he bebop. That was it. And so to second line drummers, to tam players, to funk drummers, to drummers who changed the game of how we look at hip hop. To be true, yeah. is you know because he learned. He learned from watching my grandfather, but at the same time, my grandfather didn't like him touching his drum. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandmother used to get mad at my granddaddy when they were young because he would always sneak and play the drums. And he was like, that, that he was he's the cousin of them. Look, he said, look, look, motherfucker, you ain't gonna be playing my drums. You get your own shit. So when he learned his technique came from the, the presser. The old dry press machine. We used to dry your clothes for the press. So he would go with my grandmother and pay 10 cents to press clothes. That was the technique of his plan. From how he would hear. And so him and another great musician, which we all know is Aaron Neville, both left New Orleans at the same time. They both left New Orleans for circumstances unforeseen as the story goes and went to New York and that's when it all hit you know but my uncle was a it was a trip when I I remember first meeting him as a kid when I was nine and he was such he was a trip because here I am a little kid understood you know he was a Muslim my dad is Muslim but it was amazing to talk to him because we was talking for hours, because he was just amazing. 
He used to say that. So he said, hey, this little motherfucker, he, he can talk to adults. He know he's a drama like that. Said, oh, yeah. And he said, oh, he, he, he a drama. He says, so then, so I can't wait to hear him. I said, you going to hear him? And she didn't want me to play because I wanted to play for him. I was like, so he, he going to hear you. And like that, the life changed. And he was like, yo, witty. The Before he passed, three years before he passed, when he was still playing, three years, yeah, he said, we, we're going to do this album together. Because he was going to synagogue, working with Yusuf Endur. And I was shocked. I said, oh, you know Yusuf Endur? We did an album together. And from that day, I said, you know, I said, if I'm able to link with Yusuf and tell him this story, because that's who I wanted on my last album. I was really trying to get Yusuf on the album. But it didn't work out. But you never know what the next one will bring. Because I'm coming for it. But that man, for me, because I never met my grandfather because he passed before I was born. But my uncle, watching him, talking to him, hanging around him, holding his hand, walking side by side, was the closest I could ever have gotten to meeting my grandfather. Mm. So... He would always say, I can't, I can't play with your grandfather because your grandfather told me I wasn't shit. And when I gig <laughs> with Roberta Flack, he told me at the gig, you sound like shit. And he was the one that told my uncle that he said, you need to get your left hand stronger. So what he did, because he was still living in Austria at this time, the time, that he got a thicker stick on his left hand and wrapped it with like cloth tape that he got from Beyond Borgs, the tennis player. On his left hand was the thicker stick, and on the right hand was a thinner one. He said, for the rest of your life, play like that. He's going to get your hand strong. And that's before he saw it. He didn't get to say goodbye to his brother because he had passed away probably a year after that. But it was his, his nod to him doing that. Okay. He told me to do that, and he did it. So if you ever watch a video of Idris Palmer, look at his left hand and look at the sticks. They're always two different, two different st- sizes and styles. Look at it. That's a nugget right there. I love that. That's a nugget. Yeah, it's a real nugget. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it is, you know, having a person like that in your life. imagine and that's a beautiful reflection i just wanted you know a lot of your answers to my questions are very personal reflections and i just wanted to honor that and thank mm-hmm. you for like taking it there you oh, know, man. not everybody goes there so i just wanted to to honor that it's real man i mean i have to honor them by being honest so and you know we gotta honor them you know what i'm saying when I was younger, f- discovering jazz and groove, you know, every every time I seemed to open a record, Idris was on the kit. Whether he was still Leo Morris or whether he was Idris, it seemed like mm-hmm. more often than not, the stuff that I gravitated to most, you know, the Reuben Wilson, Grant Green, Donald Byrd, all that stuff from the late 60s, early 70s, that kind of turned me on was the first like music of that kind, Black American music of that mm-hmm. kind that I loved. Mm-hmm. He was almost mm-hmm. always involved, you know? Yeah. And that's, yes. you know, hip hop, you know, like you mentioned earlier, I mean, he informed hip hop as much as any other drummer. Absolutely. 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 You got to celebrate, you know, his legacy you know, beyond just the funk and hip hop. And I think that that's going to open up some doors. You just describing, uh, you know, his work outside of that spectrum uh, with African music, making records, uh, 
that's something that I'm going to want to explore now that you, you brought it to our attention. Rich, look up an album he did with Yusu in like 2004 or five, maybe six or seven, maybe, maybe 2010 called Return to Gore for Yusu Endure. They recorded at Gore Island. Are you familiar with Gore Island? Gore Island, Gore Island, it was the center, it's the place called the door, it was where the door of no return was. That's was the last place where enslaved people was taken before they came to foreign land. Oh, and wow. they did a concert wow. there. Yeah, it's very beautiful and very in- intense bet. concert. Wow, thank you. I will definitely look that up. I'll put it in the show notes for anyone else who's listening who's curious. You talked about Christian before and uh, and your relationship and how you came to speak the same language and the brotherhood. I think you can hear a lot of that on, and I hope I pronounce it correctly, Ode to Bantuku. Oh, Ode to Bantuku. That's actually, you know who that is playing? That's Troy. That's Trombone Shorty. Oh, really? Yeah, that's Trombone Shorty. Yeah. Which is, which, that's not Kitchen. He's on um, Hippo, Sent for Me. Hippos in space and Sako Dugu. Okay. Uh, I got them right next to each other. Okay. Uh, I, my bad. Yeah. You, so you see, Otubatuko is okay. Trombone Shorty. Uh, yeah. And that, that's a, that's a, it's, it's, me and him have a very special relationship. Very special too. Yeah. Well, you know, he's one of my close friends, but we always talk about each other. We, we laugh, we crack jokes on each other. But what, like I talk about the spiritual, the, the spiritualism in each person, he has it as well. He's a very, 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 very smart person, but he takes the music and he takes what he's trying, like I always say, what he's trying to convey to music to hit him in the chest. And he's doing it on two instruments, both trombone and trumpet. But Old Tubantuku is about my father. Old Tubantuku is about my father's group. He started in Champaign, Urbana. The first ever high life Afrobeat funk jazz fusion band in America. Wow. What were they called? Bantuku. Oh, okay. Perfect. Which my mother was the drummer for. Wow. At a time, yeah. So it's very unique. His writer, I, used to, I, I say this, I say it's like if the Return of Forever, Spira Gyra, uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra stayed in Africa, stayed in Ghana for, uh, for a thousand years. And a person was like listening to all that stuff and they created a band. That's what my dad's group was. He was out there. The writing was unreal. He was, his writing was crazy. So um, he wanted to take some of the students who was in the jazz band to show them how to play this this style of music? Same shit I'm doing. Same shit. Um, but he used to play at a club called Nature's Table, and every Wednesday, or Thursday night, the band would play, and people would be coming like, "What kind of shit is this?" <laughs> they couldn't compute it. They were like, "What the hell?" They would dance, but they were the sophistication of the parts, but they would dance. It was like this can't just be African. This is something else. So. Uh, I wanted to create a song that he, that brought me that that took me there. But I already created because every time I was hum this melody, there's a melody in the song that was a part of um, of a song my dad wrote. It's at the end of it says, and that's the most emotional and part of the song for me because mm. that from that from eighty eight. To now, 
I can see, smell, hear, and feel the emotion when we will play that that melody today, tonight, now. So I want to tell my father that, you know, he will forever be my hero. He will forever be a star. And uh, when we when we put that song down, I, I, was, I, was, I was almost done. And I said, you know, I want to take it somewhere. So Troy, I was bothering him. I said, man, you going to do my album? Mm-hmm. You know I'm doing your damn album. You, know, you, well, you don't probably try to say, well, you know I'm doing your album. You one of my close friends. I love you. We did don't do me like that, brother. You know I'm going to do your album, you know? And I kept going to the spot, and I was like, you doing it? So then one day he said, bro, on Thursday at 3 o'clock, I'm going to call you. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. I didn't call about two months, blah, blah, blah. And at 3 o'clock on a Thursday, I get a call from Troy, the Trumbo Shorty. And he says, what yet? I said, I'm at home. You in town or you in you in Cleveland with your girl? I say, well, I'm in New Orleans. I'm in New Orleans. I'm working on the album. He says, come to my spot at three o'clock. Don't be late. I say, man, bring your hard drive. I'm like, whatever. I'll be there. It's three ten. You're late. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, bro, I'm here. I'm outside. He opens the door. Let's go upstairs. So we go upstairs. It's me and our good friend, Charlie, who was doing the engineering. And he's listening to the song I would originally want him on, Sent For Me. And he's listening. And he's like, man, it's a beautiful song, man. He said, but that song is so powerful, it's done. So I had this, the track of Old to Bantuku, and I started playing. And he said, wait a minute. He said, stop. And I played it not on purpose. <laughs> it was just like, went for the next song. It was like, but the Dutch can get get you but they ain't got that but they ain't up to but he says play that again <laughs> and he just says keep playing it and he sat in his chair he had his hands folded he said Charlie run me back to that um, solo part right there about to try something he goes downstairs and he laid the greatest solo that I've ever heard and then said, that ain't the one. I say, what? <laughs> then he did another five. He said, that ain't the one. Then he did the one that changed the emotional game. I said, and he looked at me and said, that's it. Now I'm about to, he said, then he says, where's my trombone? I said, and he's like, man, I feel good with him. I'm practicing, I'm playing this music. And I remember, and then I had some ideas of this part. I said, well, I'll play this part. Play this, that, and do this, this, blah, blah. He says, and I remember him sitting down at the end. And he says, you got one hell of a song. And I'm sitting there with tears in my eyes. I said, I can't believe you did that for me. He says, and he looked at me and said, because you're my friend. You're my brother. And I'm going to always be here for you. And then we started insulting each other some more. And he gave me this hug. And he says, you got something with him. He said, I don't even play music like this. This makes me feel good. And I remember mixing it and sending it to him. And he was like, and I didn't meet your dad, man, but he proud of you on this one. And he was like, you got something powerful here. You got something powerful here, Farley, as he would say. And it was that. And that song really, it touched me because I felt my father's influence. It was once... We added the horns. It made it Bantu. Oh. It made it Bantu. I said, now we got it Bantu. Now this is it. You know, old to Bantu, backwards, forwards. Forward to go back. You know what I'm saying? So,
He heard it. The song was done, and then we were going over the this, over the that, and put this. When he added what he needed, I didn't have to do nothing else. The song was alive. It was alive then. But it was like, now, it was, and then I said, now I can play. Now I said, I'm going to add my Jimmy. And now I can talk with him. And when we did it, he was like, whoo. It was one point, he was like, man, you hear them rhythms? Man, he was always like, the inner, so he would always flip out. He says, man. He said, I don't know what to call this, man. I don't know. It's a genre of his own, <laughs> you know? So There's an interesting uh, detail there. You add the djembe very late in the process. I add the djembe at the end. Unless I'm playing with the band and we're tracking all together, then I'll play. But the lead part, I add it at the end because I want to be able to talk to the music. I want the music to know that I'm leading it. And well, how can you lead it when it's not there? Because the djembe is the voice. If everything's there, music can be led once it's created. Yeah. It was when it was done, I was able to maneuver the listener to know that I'm taking you on a ride. That this instrument is taking you on a ride and the music is done. That's why so many layers on the album and those layers represent certain portals that I'm trying to take people to. Yeah. I love that. You know what I'm saying? That you see it as speaking so therefore, the music has to be the foundation and the djembe is you speaking. And there you go. I love it, man. There you go. This is why I do this, man. This like, I, I thought I knew this music a little bit, but I didn't know nothing, you know? And, and, and talking to you like this is, now I'm gonna go back to it with all new perceptions open. Yeah, man. I mean, I wanted djembe music to really get its respect. And the djembe to get a respect. And the conga to get a respect. And the sabar to get the respect. And the dunu to get the respect. And the bata to get the respect. All the folkloric instruments that's on here that are hand drums to get a respect that needs to be deserved. Because, yeah, easily, you can see us playing with bands and we, you know, we're over there in the corner or we may be playing a solo and people go crazy. But you guys realize that these instruments are melodic and they lead. Yeah. And so shout out to the people who are doing that now. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I think that once you show audiences like ours that it's possible, not just possible, but it's incredible, that we might see more of that. We might, it might not be in the corner or just a solo, but you might see more bands led by drummers, by Jembe It's Bola. starting to happen. It's starting to happen. I mean, there's one young boy in Europe, in the UK, one of my little babies. He's a great Jembe Fuller. Yahil Onono Kamara. He has a group called Bali Maya. Great album. They just released that great album. Powerful album. Of course, I talked about the um, um, Emmanuel Wilkins just did a project. Um, a single came out with one of his drummers, Kwaku Sumbri, who's his kid player, as well as Jimmy Fuller. And they had a song that was featuring the Jimmy Orchestra on that, as well as people like Maget um, Fal, Maget So who is the percussionist for Angelique Kijo, who has an amazing project that's out, along with um, Abu Kamara, who's got a project coming out, along with uh, Akibo Rory, Amadou Kuyate, all these amazing musicians, Jimmy Fuller's who are coming out, um, Kiazi Malonga. The time of the folkloric drum is out. Of course, me and Pedro are pushing albums, and Pedro has been pushing amazing, Petrito Martinez has yeah. been pushing amazing albums. But now, the change happened. That's why I'm happy I was able to do an album that I pray that would go down as somebody and something that will have changed the focus and the idea and the identity of what they think the instrument is. You know, Sam? I think the show is bigger than us. Su succeeded in doing that and then some. And hopefully the first of many, you know? Oh, definitely. And definitely. Yeah, you said it, you know, about bringing respect and honor and attention to. Djembe, um, and you said it in the last song, you know, Sworn to the Drum. You are the source of my strength. I am a vessel of you. I mean, that is a right. that is a mission statement if there ever was one. Yeah, the Sworn to the Drum is a prayer and a, and a salute to all the people who changed the game for what I'm trying to do now. They did it and people have to know that they are still with us. And this album is of them. And I wish I could have said more names, but 
those people were, were are, are it. Yeah. If without those people, it would be no damn weedy brain market at all. At all. Not just because the family is on there, because of the identity of what they all brought. Right. Yeah, and it's a powerful. That's why for me, that's a powerful song. Yeah. yeah exactly. Powerful song, powerful statement to leave us with after we have gone on the journey of the record. It is something, and you mentioned earlier, like you're ready for what's next. So I think if whatever you're comfortable, what, what do you see as the next chapter of the hands of time? True respect for this instrument and what we're conveying. And that it is okay to love something that you're not familiar with. <laughs> yeah. It is totally fine to indulge and, and, and delve into something that you will feel like, well, that's, that's not, you know, and it, and I pray that young children can see this instrument and have the same feeling I got when I'll see somebody play it. And they would, you think their rock stars would not just be like, like mine's was Mami Dikato or Ola Tunji or, Elijah or Morcham or Sungalo or Giovanni and people like that who that they can see the new age of the new Jimmy Fowles and new people, you know, that are around them to be their new heroes, rock stars. And that you ain't got to do X, Y, and Z to be a great musician. You can play your craft and your craft can be your way. The folklore craft can be your way. You don't have to be the last one hired and the first one, you uh, know, let a fight from fire. That you can create your own way and that the world will respect and love it and see the value of it and know that you're valued and that that value would take you far and near and far and everywhere around and that that spirit that you obtain will show the beauty of the instrument and that spirit that, that op, you obtain will work on your behalf too so that's why and that's what I see and I see that this band will be a pillar hopefully a pillar in the future of what folkloric music is going to be. You know what I'm saying? I just, I hope, I, that's what I want. Maybe people say that's like, that's kind of out there, but hey, you don't know until you try. You don't know until you are able to see where, where you're trying to go. You know what I'm saying? And they say a good market boom starts early in the morning. <laughs> that's a, it's a beautiful <laughs> prayer and, and hope and vision, you know, as I like to say from your lips or in your case, from your lips and your hands, to jaw ears. Um, I hope yeah, that there you go. I, I believe that um, that the opportunity is there for you in the hands of time and and the other musicians that you influence, that you inspire to realize that dream, that vision for the drum and for Jembe Folas, uh, not just here in the States, but elsewhere. I mean, this is global music. This is music that's touching people on all corners of the land. And yeah, I'm just honored to hear it from the source. Um, I, again, I feel like anytime I speak with you, I learn a lot and I listen to your music, I learn a lot, but this is very educational, inspirational, emotional, spiritual, just to speak with you, um, for you to open your life up to me and our listeners. Again, it's a great honor and privilege, Weedy. I love you. Thank you so much, B. I love you too, brother. And you know, it's always a pleasure and honor talking and seeing you, man. You're always at our events. But just know that we're working on some cool things, you know. Like, again, hopefully you can come to New York um, April 5th and 6th at the Blue Note. Beautiful. But our good friend, yeah, it was, uh, we bring my hands of time at the Blue Note, April 5th and 6th with um, Hotel Burbridge and um, two nights. Four shows, two show a night, huh. fifth and sixth. And then, you know, we got some dates coming up. One, uh, some I can talk about, some I can't, like Florida, and um, we're going to be in Jacksonville. Yeah, I saw and, that um, announcement at 1904. Music Hall, yep. yeah, 1904, yeah. Music is, is going to check us out. We're with the Night Crawlers. Yeah. And hopefully Jazz Fest, so, man, you know, I'll try to, you know, make some noise. Jazz, yeah, man, Jazz Fest, come on, I mean. Hopefully we can do this, these shows. We're working on some things, but Jazz Fest, come on. I understand, you know, but that's all right. Sometimes it takes some time for people to get hip, you know. The city's already hip, but sometimes it takes the people that think they know music 
Well, that's where I come in, man. I'm going to make some noise. You know, I was going to say I bang the drum, but maybe that's not appropriate euphemism. <laughs> so I'll just say I'm going to sound the alarm and let people know. Because I, sound I, written, written. There you go. I've said it a number of times. I wrote it up like the music box experience. And I saw you twice. I saw another show that week also. Uh, the separate you played a uh, different essence uh hands of time yes show. Sir. yes sir. that's right we did some earlier my birthday party. yeah so i mean i know that that stuff resonates with people that aren't from new orleans that aren't already hip to it you know from personal experience i mean i came to that show came away a different person literally you know and i, I don't say that often i could probably count on one hand how many times i've had such a visceral physical emotional reaction you know, I was like basically crying on Luke's shoulder afterwards. Like I just didn't know where to put. I that. remember. Um, and here I am four years later and, uh, you know, I'm sworn to the drum dog. That's right. That's right. That's right. And guess what? There's more to come. Can't wait. There's more to come. You let me know anything you're doing, whatever projects, you know, I'm behind it. Bacante, Hands of Time, whatever you're doing, you let me know. Yes, sir. Will do. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah. More is best. Yeah. Any parting words for the for the people? Well, buy the album, support the hands of time, support the members in the hands of time, support African music, support people who are pro prolonging and preserving this culture and keeping it alive. Support the people who you believe are going to preserve it. And keep just being a listener and respectful conduit of it. So, I mean, yeah. say thank you to my man Weedy Brema just an illuminating and educational conversation my man is teacher he's a visionary he's a prophet he's a wizard and a magician and a virtuoso so many things Weedy Foley my man check out Weedy Brema in the hands of time the album up for a Grammy and I can't thank him enough for taking us on that ride I um, want to let folks know you know we started a campaign on the last episode with Johnny G and Scott Sachs Johnny G from Les Special Scott Sachs from Music Right and they're raising money for the Music Cellar which is a dedicated space for music education in upstate New York founded by the guys from the special uh, lessons cover real life skills like self-awareness listening engaging with others as well as all kinds of musical lessons guitar bass piano production podcasting you name it so we're trying to raise some money for these kids and this school check it out musicright.org and that's music R-I-G-H-T dot org. There's a big button that says current campaign and click on that. There's a donate button and a whole lot about the project. So wanted to let folks know we're about halfway to the goal of 500 bucks. Uh, might even be further along, but really stoked to be doing this kind of philanthropic stuff with music right and the special and the music seller so check that out i know weedy would be proud he's all about teaching the children and with that like we always do about this time the vibe junkie jam and you know played a lot of hands of time from weedy but my introduction to him as a performer and as a musician 
was as a member of the Nth Power in their earliest embryonic incarnation. Nigel Hall, Weedy, and of course Nikki, Nate, and Nick. So it was a legendary show I wrote about at Bear Creek 2013 that really hooked me. And that's when I kind of caught the, the magic of Weedy Brema for the first time. So I'm going to play some old school Nth Power. Uh, we're going to, from the Aura Sessions, shout out to Daryl. Uh, Aura was a festival that took place at Swanee. And they would have these in-studio performances recorded from time to time. So there's a beautiful version of Walk on Water. I want to send this out to anybody out there who's lost someone dear to them. Really ever, but definitely recently. Um, This is a song for the heart, for the spirit. The Nth Power loves you. This, I'm certain. So, yeah. Weedy Brahma, The Hands of Time, and of course... The Nth Power. So here comes Walk on Water from 2014. And uh, with that, we'll say goodbye, Ja Bless, and we'll see you next time. to our friend up in Boston. I want to give a shout out to DC. He's been fighting the good fight. This song is dedicated to you, man. We love you. And, uh, you know, we're here for you. We're sending our positive healing energy and healing vibes your way. This is for you, man. Desert night sky, blind and bright. Stars burn deep in the veins of the chosen tonight. You see what you want to see, and hear what you want to hear. But if you dance a little bit closer, love, the way will become clear. have to be about the Does it have to be about searching? Does it have to be about you? Does it have to be about yearning? Does it have to be about God? Does it have to be about trying? While the devil in my soul keeps me dying That they searched for And you are the one That I yearn for Let God be the one Who keeps me trying While the devil in my soul Keeps me dying I hear the angels and the demons say can you wait just a little bit longer? We am calm, but it is time. Can you wait just a little bit longer? Yeah, it'll come when it is time.
Doesn't have to be about waiting Doesn't have to burn my veins Doesn't have to be about changing or Growing again Doesn't have to be about me Must I take responsibility For the devil in my soul God in my heart hey. Something lives within us Deeper than bone and blood Something keeps us surging on yeah. Through the dirt and mud Is it the fear in your eyes? Or the booze on your breath? I'd say the next step will help me sing it. Walk on water. Walk on water. Walk on water, DC. Walk on water.